Uh, he is one of the greatest theater critics ever to live. Someone who, for many of us, this is, um, this is like a, a hero's welcome here to Colorado Springs. It is my pleasure to introduce John Lahr. Thank you so, so very much for being here. It's a real, a real honor. Fun for me. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start us off. We, we have one hour, and I, we were talking at breakfast for about an hour and a half, and we hardly scratched the surface of all the things I want to know from you. But we'll do what we can. Let's start off um, with just sort of an easy one. How did you get interested in writing theater criticism? Well, I don't, you know, I don't think anybody starts by being wanting to be a drama critic. <laughs> Uh, I didn't really uh, know uh, I would do this. Uh, I, uh, when I was at university, as a w w means of actually getting to know my father, I decided to write a biography of him. Uh, and I was doing that all through university. And when I finished, I, w I, came, I went to Oxford and came back. And uh, I submitted an article, uh, I think I told some people yesterday, to a giveaway magazine on the east side of New York. Uh, on Mar Assad, and uh, I just, I had studied English at Oxford uh, with a great critic called Christopher Ricks, who actually has spawned not only me, but Anthony Lane of The New Yorker, and uh, the woman who writes the drama criticism for the London Observer. So he was very influential, a brilliant critic, now has the chair at Brandeis. And I knew, had written lots, and thought critically about plays and books, and so I wrote this article. The, guy, the, guy, the editor liked it and didn't like his current drama critic. He said, would you like free tickets to the theater? And I was living a writer's life, which is to say, really, really uh, uh, on nothing. And uh, so we free tickets uh, to go to the theater. Uh, why not? So uh, I, I did it. And the, because it was a giveaway paper, it had lots of space. So I wrote the kind of criticism that I wanted to read, which was not what was currently being written, and still isn't, generally speaking. And um, within about six months, my then wife would send these pieces out to the makers of the theater. And within about six months, we started to hear from the people who wrote the plays or directed them. Uh, I heard from Pinter, I heard from Jules Pfeiffer, I heard from Alan J. Lerner, uh, and uh, uh, all of those, it I, I suddenly realized that there, people were responding to this writing. I wanted to be a writer. I, you know, I had no audience. Uh, I found it very expressive. I found that I could, in writing about uh, and interpreting plays, I could, I could A, define what I thought and say what I wanted to say through writing about these other things. But basically, uh, since I'd been raised in the theater, my, not only was my father, uh, um, I think, a genius actor, but my mother was a Ziegfeld girl. So the, the, I, that was my milieu, that's what I knew. Although I didn't know that it was any value to me uh, because I, my, the last thing my father would want me to do was be A, a theater critic, or, uh, or, or, or B, not make any money. Uh, so, uh, and believe me, uh, the, the, that certainly was true. Uh, so I, that was $10 a column. Uh, so uh, the, I never thought that this life that uh, I had lived would be of any uh, use to me um, economically or artistically. I just had no thought of it. I was just writing the, this book on my father and thinking that I, I had had journalistic experience and that I would probably become uh, a correspondent or something like that uh, because that's where I was. I was headed in the direction of journalism in some form, but what I really liked was writing and then suddenly I found that I actually knew something about something that I didn't realize I knew, which was to say the world of the theater. And here it was, and I started to get a response, and, and that was the beginning. I, I then ended up, I mean, you know, the, the thing about, the thing, I'm talking to you, but I have to, You're talking to you, about right. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the thing about, the thing, the thing is that critics don't make theater. They're made by theater. 
And I was very fortunate to be at the right age and at the right time to catch the first wave of the off-Broadway scene. And I was absolutely perfectly placed to uh, capitalize on that. I, I was writing for Evergreen Review, which was the house magazine for Grove Press. Grove Press published all the modern canon from Brecht to Orton to Beckett to UNESCO. And they wanted me to write essays about their product, so to speak. And I was also the critic for The Voice. And within a year or two, I was literary manager of Lincoln Center. So I could, and I did, publish a play, review the play, and put it on. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that was just an extraordinary and, and kind of weird situation. And uh, one of the reasons I think uh, I, I moved away uh, from America. Well, I live in London and have lived in London for 30, uh, more than 30 years now, I guess, um, was that it was, it was extraordinarily heady, but I sort of knew that it was much easier, and very easy, and you see it all the time in America, to be successful and visible and to do the work. And I really wanted to do the work, and the only way to do that was to get away from the, uh, the sort of celebrity visibility power thing. So I, I sort of went to England to get vaccinated from ambition because nobody cares over there, believe me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, and that's sort of how it, how it started. Well, one of the things that we were talking about a little bit uh, before was this, the idea of, you keep using the word critic or criticism and, and the difference between a critic and a reviewer, and, and what that means in the United States and what it means in England. I, I have to just pull a little bit of a quote from this article that you recommended to me called Critics or Critics by Yourself. Uh, it was a, that, yeah, you should say it was a polemic. It was a polemic, uh, not a, that's fine, yes. And you, you, were, you, you quote a, a quote unquote critic, and then you, you write, his chirpy tone is the voice not of a critic, but a cricket. The derogatory label theatricals sometimes apply, apply to critical enterprise. Talk a little bit more about that, the difference in what you, what you see here in the United States and in England with that sort of writing. Well, I think it's a, uh, it, the word critic has sort of been, you know, just grossly abused and hijacked for any sort of nonsense of opinion. Uh, I make a distinction between critic and reviewing. Um, and th there's a really huge dis uh, distinction. I, I would argue that there's almost no criticism of the theater in America, and almost all reviewing. I mean, a critic, in my view, is not, d not only looks at uh, the theater, but looks after it. And the, the reviewer looks after the audience. Uh, it's a market research function. The issue, the interest is, did he like it or didn't, or she, did, they, did he like it or not? Uh, do I want to go? Do I want to invest my money? What's the story? Now, that is not what criticism is. I mean, a critic is there not to make a market, but to make meaning and to, to treat the play as a metaphor and to interpret it, to link it, to make the audience, of course, see what the play is, uh, to understand what the play is, to give them the sense of being there. And of course, to have an opinion, but I'm not interested just in saying my opinion. I'm interested in bringing the life of the theater and what it means to, to what, the, what the event means uh, to an audience. And if I can go on on this, when I, when I was first hired by The New Yorker, um, Atina Brown, who was the editor who hired me in 1992, uh, didn't really like conventional criticism, and neither did I. And I was hired to write what we, between us, thought was a new kind of criticism. And, and that was to bring the reader inside the theater. I mean, ha, you know, my criticism of the, of, even when I was, before I was a drama critic, was that the, what I was reading g gave no sense of, of really the event, or the feel of it, the fun of it, the grit of it. And uh, I, I wanted to sort of bear better witness to the theater, uh, which is what I wanted to do with my biography of my father, which I can, I'll come back to. But so we agreed. I mean, I wanted a, a, a kind of criticism that was not written from the reading room, but from the green room. 
Um, and so the, the really good example of it, and actually uh, this, uh, this piece is included in, in Joyride, was the third, and th this is again my luck, uh, the third play on my watch at the New Yorker was Angels in America. And I went, again, the blessing of the New Yorker, it felt like, a ma and it always has, felt like a magic carpet. I went to LA to see the first performance of Angels in America in Toto, both, both plays. Now, to the, my review, in my review, I talked to Tony before the show, and we talked about, which I knew because uh, I, I, I was around theatricals, I knew he had some sort of magic thing that he did, good luck thing. So I asked him what it was. Well, it turns out that Tony needs to sing Begin the Begin from beginning to end <laughs> without stopping. Uh, and then, once that's done, when, because it's the longest song without a chorus that exists, <laughs> And, and then he needs to go out and have a Chinese meal. But in this case, since it was two plays, he was going to have two Chinese meals. <laughs> so I reported that. We then went into the theater. Uh, I described who was there, because this was a major event. Uh, who was there, I knew, because I reported it, the book that he'd given to the producer and the inscription in it. I reviewed the play and interpreted it, and then, I went backstage afterwards and saw Tony in long shots, so to speak, but also saw on the bill on the blackboard, uh, not on the blackboard, on the bulletin board, a letter that Tony had written to the cast, a gorgeous letter, something about it, how can an angel come to earth but through sweat and difficulty and something like that. All that came in, all that I saw, all that I reported. And if anybody wants to know what it was like to be there on the night that probably the greatest play of, uh, since The Glass Menagerie uh, in, our, in our culture, there it is. And that review breaks every rule of conventional journalism, which is I want to break. I hate the hidebound nature of uh, well, there's no game in town except the Times. Uh, I hate it. It, it absolutely ensures ignorance because it insists on objectivity, that the, which is completely, as you would agree, I'm sure, uh, there's no such thing as objectivity. Uh, it, it's it's an, a, a foolish kind of uh, uh, thing to try to legislate, I think. Uh, and the... The idea, the, the Times and a lot of newspapers insist that the critic not, n actually not fraternize with or uh, uh, involve himself in any way with the thing that he is reporting on. Um, I guess this is because of market forces. Uh, but you see, that it absolutely ensures ignorance on the part of the critic. And it absolutely flies in the face of historical proof because the greatest critics on either side of the Atlantic ever were always critics who slept on both sides of the bed, uh, who, were, who actually were involved in the theater and who wrote about it. Well, we can, if you want, Shaw, Tynan, Stark Young, Eric Bentley, Robert Brewstein, Harold Klerman, and on and on. Uh, so, and why is that? Because they actually can, the, it, many people can like something, but they don't know why it's good. Or if it doesn't work, they don't know why it doesn't work. And while it's probably true that a, uh, that may be true of, of me too sometimes, but I have a better, the odds are better that I'm gonna get it more right than more wrong uh, for having been involved with and uh, in, in theater, one of my gripes about the reviewers is that, you know, you on, they're only there to purvey an opinion. I mean, if you're a, a critic, you have to have a word hoard. You have to be able to use language. You are an entertainer with language. So one of my arguments about criticism as opposed to reviewers, let's, I mean, I'm not talking about critics here, I'm talking about reviewers, is that most of the people who are handing out this punchy opinion this sort of 
crisp snarkiness, ha haven't, have never written a joke, written a play, taken an acting class, uh, been in the theater, have no working knowledge of the very thing that they have such strong opinions about. And it, it bothers me because, and I have to say, and that none of these critics ever say the first rule, principle, of criticism, or, or of, of being a critic, which is that criticism is a life without risk. And anybody, uh, and therefore, uh, that when you read critics, uh, I'm sorry, reviewers, uh, who are, you know, are they, so really nasty. I mean, there, there, was a, there was a critic, I mean, he's, he's too mean to die, called John Simon, uh, <laughs> who, 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 uh, who would say, you know, would just talk about an actress's <coughs> drooping breasts or her, uh, her uh, you know, just, just vile things about. Uh, well, you know, anybody who would use the authority of a newspaper to uh, abuse a, an actor, uh, who would do that, who would do that, uh, has never made anything, has never created anything. Because if you have created something, if you have made something and put something into the world, you know how, how, how much it takes. If you've actually worked on a play, you know the kind of passion and uh, obsession and risk that it takes to, to try to express anything. So that at least the knowledge that giving an opinion is a life without risk makes, should make you both humble and watch your tongue to find a language that can discriminate and argue but not obliterate. And uh, that's uh, something that I, I hope I've been able to do, but it's something that's very, I think, important because you, the purpose of, of real criticism is to create a discussion, to, as I say, to interpret. There's no Clerman who was my mentor. Um, used to always say, there's no right and wrong, there's just good argument. And my, ar <clears throat> my criticism of the current state of critical writing is that there's no argument at all. There's no discussion. You read a, you read a Times review, you read any review, you're, they're not discussing what the plate means or what, or, or, when, or they're not describing, they're not describing um, exactly why a particular actor is good in this play. They're just praising or blaming in a kind of global way, which is a way of not thinking. And the whole point of criticism is to stimulate thought. That's the whole, that's the whole deal. And to encourage a healthy discussion. Now, when I began this biography of my father, which I started when I was 20, and I finished when I was 28. It was published when I was 28, I think. So uh, it took me a long time um, to learn how to write, actually. And, um, but I had to wade through uh, my dad's press clippings and everything that had been written about him. And I'm not, I'm not kidding that he, um, he, he probably, I mean, he had enough great reviews to fill a good size room. I mean, a big, I mean, 50 years of that kind of performance, a beloved performer. So he was, he was always written about. But there were perhaps, in all the mounds and mounds of print about him, maybe two articles that even approached who I knew he was, uh, who had any, and I thought, the, the, the insight that that brought to me, which actually I've carried through all my work because it also comes into the writing of profiles for The New Yorker, is that these, these celebrities, uh, I, I use the word in the old notion of fame, fame in its actual meaning is rumor of deeds. So I'm talking about people who do things. Uh, uh, 
not, 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 not people who are sort of famous because they have access to a TV camera. Um, uh, now, the, um, the, thing, the thing is, all I wanted to, it was really simple. I just wanted to bear better witness to the, th the theatrical world. You know, Shakespeare talks about the abstract brief chronicles of actors being abstract brief chronicles of their time, and I believe that. I believe that these people are the unlegislated, un unelected legislators of the culture uh, in the sense that it's through their, that somehow they articulate feelings in the population that the people don't, can't define for themselves, that they, they form a sense of style. Coward is the absolute, takes that absolutely to the max. Britishness as we know it, is kind of coward's invention. That you know, I mean, I'm not kidding. I'm a, I'm absolutely dead. I'm absolutely not kidding. I mean, the whole clipped, pucka, elegant, uh, witty, you know, um, uh, uh, courageous, uh, but you know, uh, slightly malicious. Uh, uh, that's all very very coward and. He actually influenced a generation of uh, how people presented themselves, and that happens in our culture too, not always to the benefit of the culture, but uh, uh, anyway, what I'm saying is that part of my, I don't quite know, I guess it was to align myself with my father's heritage because to keep the theater alive, I, I wanted to bear better witness to the, these special, performing figures and to interpret them, to treat them as they are, as metaphors for the time, to put them in a larger context and to put the work in a larger context. That seemed to me to be a valuable thing to do and um, I've sort of spent my life kind of doing that in a way, just building up a sort of a, a because unfortunately with the decline of the newspapers, and the sort of sensational triviality of the media environment that we're in, the, the only thing that people really are interested or seem to be interested in are the most shallow, craven, and totally uninteresting aspects of the performing world, which are of no interest at all. And one of the things I'm interested in doing is keeping the theatricals, who after all, the theater is actually feeding all the media, cult, the, the, the cinema, all those actors that we love in the cinema are all theater trained and keeping the ideas of, uh, of these actors in the discussion, uh, because mostly it's talking about lifestyle and divorces. You know, I mean, it's not anything that's relevant to anything. And so that's the goal of, and that is, I think, what the critical intention should be and why I separate criticism from reviewing. I'm not saying that there aren't critics uh, in America, I'm just saying uh, there aren't enough of them, and part of that problem is that a lot of the problem is with the management of magazines and newspapers that don't care enough or haven't thought about it enough to change the sort of way they do business about the theater. I, I think there's no reason, say for instance in the Times, that they should review every play. I'd rather have fewer reviews and more discriminating longer reviews uh, so that the critic if he has a style, and if he has a word hoard, and if he is bright, can actually be his best self in print. And you just don't see that. You don't see that ever. Can I, can I, uh, can I move a little bit to profile writing? Because you've mentioned that a couple times, and I know a lot, of, a lot of you know John from his profiles in, in The New Yorker. It's been wonderful listening to you talk about what goes into a profile, and I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about that process of writing a profile uh, perhaps by picking a specific one or, or however you'd like to talk about it. Sure. Um, well, a profile is uh, a, a literary exercise that actually um, the New Yorker reinvented. Uh, uh, it was a, in a way, in the, in the modern sense. It, the, the, it's a, it, it is a, for theater, uh, it's now about, my first profile was 25,000 words, Damanda Everidge. But the usual profile is between eight to 10,000 words. Um, and uh, I try, it's a kind of, I follow my own lights of things, people I like, and I take suggestions, and very often 
uh, because Nicole Kidman opened in a show two days ago or something, and the editor will say, what about a profile of Nicole Kidman? And I have to decide whether I want to spend, that's about four months uh, researching and writing. But what I do is I write to the proposed person and suggest it. But when I suggest it, I say two things. I say, there is no tabloid intention. And for this to be good, it has to be a collaboration. Because what I want to do is I want to get close to the person, see the person up close, but, and, and have access to the person so that in different situations, so that I can see them and how they operate in, in rehearsal, in, with their children, with, with, any, with anything. It doesn't matter, but just so that there are scenes. And what that also means is that in order to, when you're dealing with really big stars like Al Pacino, which is a great, I, I loved my, my time with Pacino, who was a great guy, and uh, I got a good profile out of it. Uh, but the, uh, with, with, with Pacino, you can't, nobody is gonna talk to you about a, a star that, that's that important unless the star himself says, talk to this guy. So you are, you are sort of working with an understanding that has to be slightly earned. Sometimes, of course, it's just the New Yorker's imprimatur. They're impressed by the New Yorker. Sometimes, uh, uh, I would say about 60% of the time, they've read me or know me. So that means they know what I do, and therefore they don't feel, if you say you're a critic in, say, LA, that you're like saying, I'm a rapist, you know. I'm, <laughs> you, know they, they don't, you know, they don't wanna know. And so it, it takes a little bit, if they take the challenge and they're smart, they make it happen for you, and then they let you, as it were, find them. Now, I'm, all these people who are stars, or public people, have, unless they're comedians, in which case they're unboundaried and you just walk around picking up all the mess that they create around. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they, um, all of them uh, have a very practiced persona and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the self that they present is very well worked out. That's not what I'm looking for. Uh, by the time I meet them, I've read everything that they've given to the press. I've, if they've written books, I've read those books. If I've seen the movies, I've seen or will be seeing and playing catch up to see the movies that they've made. I have a profile this week in The New Yorker on uh, Julianne Moore, uh, where I did that. I, I, I ha she made so many movies, 70. I would just have to, but Julianne put me in touch with David Cronenberg and Todd Haynes and uh, I knew Andre Gregory. So you you sort of, I always ask the, the, the subject to give me five or six people who they feel would be a witness to their life and career. And then I go and find my own people. And out of that, over time, comes a sort of theme, a theme usually that I either learn when I'm talking to them, or in some cases, uh, I have already an idea in mind of, the, of what I feel these people actually mean. What, and what I'm looking for, like with my dad, is what is inside them that they're seeking to express, to get out. It's not the thing they talk about, but it's essential to them. And um, so that takes <clears throat> a, a certain amount of time and a certain amount of trust, which happens over the time of the interview, which is about eight to 10 hours, and the nature of the questions. Because, as you know, if the, if the questions are knowing and they're not usual, they call out a different part of you and you start, you start to actually feel something for the other person. You've, what you feel is a kind of respect for what they're doing. Now, keeping in mind the thing I said before about my father, these people, as famous as Pacino is, Pacino is under celebrity arrest. He can't go out. He can't go out because everybody has a handheld uh, iPhone to take his picture. He's, he's a solitary. Uh, or he can go out under very special situations, like if they go to a restaurant, they buy, they, 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 
the, the restaurant will not have a table. The table next to theirs won't be taken or he'll buy an extra box uh, in, at the theater so there's nobody in front of them, you know, so they won't be overheard. It's impossible. So for all the thousands and thousands and millions of words, Pacino doesn't let people get up close. Um, and so it's, it's a, it, you're in a very privileged position and an interesting one. And um, they're very rarely seen. And they want, there's a way in which they want their work to be taken very seriously because they take it. But the culture doesn't write about it seriously. They don't engage with them seriously. So, you know, Jay Lar comes along asking to talk to them seriously about their work and how they did it and what they wanted and this and that. My God, let's talk about that. That's interesting to them and, uh, and to me. And there's a, a sort of bond develops. And out of that bond, if you read a, a good profile, it's because, you know, I take myself out of it. But the questions were good, and because they, you know, the the questions release something in the in the in the subject that hadn't been asked before. So that, for instance, with the Julianne Moore piece, which was startling to me, um, she's just terrific and extremely nice and very well mannered, which is unusual for the breed. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, really well-mannered. I mean, a real lady. Uh, and, but she'd written these children's books. And one of the children's books was called Freckleface Strawberry and uh, uh, the Monster or something. And when I read the children's book, it was, all, it was all clearly autobiographical. And the monster who, who, who was the monster of her imagination. Uh, which protected her and defended her, and she encouraged. So the first question when I met her and could sit down with her was not about her career, was not about L'Oreal and how much money she earned last year. It was about this children's book. And she was, it completely wrong-footed her. She thanked me for the question, and we were, we were off. Because we were taught, and her whole life is geared around trying to protect this green world from the corruption of essentially the media, and to keep it pure that she can work out of it, but she doesn't spoil it or let it be spoiled. Anyway, so that's how it operates. And you've mentioned Al and and, and Julianne and. You say that this a relationship develops be, between you and yeah. them. who who are other than those two are and by the way a lot of them are in are in uh, Joyride. Um, who are some of the people that you just developed a strong connection with? Sarah Rule, a uh, very f a wonderful playwright, and uh, Mike Nichols. Mm. Uh, I I I mean I love being with Mike Nichols, and I often drew on his. His, he, his mind and his way of expressing himself were sort of sui generis. I mean, just extraordinary insight. And he he comes into many of the stories. For instance, he directed Al in Tony Kushner's, uh, the, the film of uh, Angels in America. And so, of course, I would go to Tony, I would go to Mike to talk about uh, Al. And Al's insight, I mean, Mike's insight on Tony was great. The fact, the, the reader, just, just the, 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 the thing I'm proud of is I could get to Mike with a telephone call and ask him. And that, that's my luck of the New Yorker because people just can't get to Mike Nichols to ask him a question about Al Pacino. He's not gonna, he's not gonna take that call. And the, the, the thing about Mike, which was extremely interesting to me, we had a, he wanted me to write his profile and he waited for a year when I, until I was available for me to do it. And he made it all happen. He was smart enough to know that, I mean, I, you know, he, he did not lead any kind of blameless life. But he was, you know, I was interested in his comedy and how he transitioned. Uh, you know, he was the first director. He directed all of Neil Simon's plays. And he's the first director to get not only his royalty, but to get half of the writer's royalty, which is a strange thing. Um, and an interesting thing to talk about, which he would. Anyway, 
It was a long and fascinating discussion. And at the very, very end of it, and we were sitting in, we, we were sitting in the chaise long of his bedroom, uh, and he sort of declared himself very happy with the conversation. And I said, and I don't, I don't know, this is an indication of how close we had become in the course of having these, asking these questions. I just kept asking questions, and he kept giving me answers, and I kept asking more, and then, you know. And I, I said, you know, he said, you know, I really enjoy this. And I said, well, Mike, I do well with the inconsolable. <laughs> and he, he, the, it, it was like, I, it was like the, a, a, a prize fight. I'd somehow gotten under his guard and I'd hit him in the solar plexus. He just, was, just he, uh, with a sucker punch or something. And he, his eyes blinked and he sort of pushed back on his chair. And he said, we get a lot done. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was beautiful. Uh, it was really interesting. And we, we became very, I was going to write, I was going to, he and I were very close to writing a book, and we, to contract close. Uh, and he, like Stritch once told me that Noel Coward had asked, he, she, she'd asked Noel Coward out to dinner at the end of his life, and he demurred because he said, "I can't be Noel Coward anymore," and um, and Mike couldn't be Mike, who was dying, uh, couldn't be Mike Nichols anymore. He couldn't. The show of a plum, which was what he was a purveyor of, uh, he couldn't do it. So the book never happened. It was going to be about his art, not about his life, which was hectic, uh, but about actors and directing and the. The, the lore that, and the deep knowledge of, of, of theater that he had. And it's a shame that it will never be written uh, because, it, although I'm sure a very good uh, biography will be written on it. I was thinking, John, as you were talking about um, Al Pacino, he doesn't actually take my calls. And so yeah. I would, <laughs> I Well, he doesn't always I'm take mine either. That's yeah. the problem. <laughs> I want to, in the, in the last, I would take five minutes uh, to, chat with you and then, and then turn it over to a couple of questions for the audience. Sure. But we must talk a little bit about Noel Coward and you already have a bit because many of you are seen today or have seen Private Lives and I was pulling, looking at your, uh, re, uh, your book, uh, which by the way we also have for sale outside. Um, and you write, only when Coward is frivolous does he become in any sense profound. Could you talk a little bit about Coward in the light of Private Lives and this idea of frivolity equaling in some ways profoundness? Yeah, um, this is, um, you know, you've got to remember that the coward uh, was homosexual. He never, by his own admission, ever slept with a woman. And in England, uh, in the time that he lived, which was from 1899, uh, until, he, and he died, I think, when he died, 1973 or something like that. So uh, nine, until 1967, almost to the end of his life, uh, uh, homosexuality was a criminal offense and you could go to jail. So, and he was a star. So he was naturally closeted, but more than that, totally defended. And yet, he was trying in a kind of rear guard way to tease the, and, and undermine in the way that comedy does, massage the uh, the, the attitudes of a culture to uh, tease um, the assumptions of the culture. And I, I mean, someone like Joe Orton, about whom I also wrote a book, would just come out and slug you with it, you know, uh, just, just unmercifully, uh, all sorts of uh, attacks on, um, on the culture uh, that were just like headbutting. But Coward was much, Coward wanted to be in the mainstream of the culture. He's aspired to, the, to be absorbed and to be everywhere all the time and to be in everyone's minds. And he was, in a way, more than any man up in, uh, until the Beatles. He was the most famous man of his era in England because he, 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 his assault was complete. Uh, he, he, was a, he, he wrote 300 songs. Uh, the songs are very good. He was a master of review. He wrote these plays, which are very popular, and he also wrote, by the way, some very good volumes of autobiography. 
he was a he had a his first Rolls Royce when he was 30, his first biography when he was 30. So he was he wanted that. That's what his goal was. So he was not going to offend. So his attack had to be quite carefully and strategic. And frivolity was how he do it, how he did it. And you hear it in this play. You know, ju let's just uh, you know uh, you know blow horns and mock their, 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 their He he was attacking the gravity and the seriousness and the bourgeois assumptions of the play. And the, the, um, the way the play works is to make the perverse irresistible. Uh, and that's the game. In other words, we laugh and love the fact that these two people jilt their, their spouses and go off and have an affair and then go off again, you know, so they get away with it. And in, in that way, in the same way, how, I, Coward, I mean, in almost all the Coward's major comedies, the ends are all, the ending is always the same. The, 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 the comedian, the star, Coward, always tiptoes away from chaos. He escapes it by, the, by frivolity, by being, by being sort of uh, refusing to suffer. Uh, and frivolity is a refusal to suffer and also in a sort of insistence in a mischievous way of um, turning the world upside down. So that what we, we, the game is a very camp game, which is what's bad is good and what's good is bad. It's a sort of uh, the, the psychic jujitsu of the sort of camp imagination, which he would not admit, he did admit it in one play, 1929, which was never done, called Semimond, where you hear his camp voice. He had one, he just would not use it. But he did mar, the camp element was in the, the way the plays operate and the, in the lightness. But it is profound, I think, and, and it does speak across generations. I mean, right now in London, there's, a, there's always a production, at least one every year in the West End almost, of a coward play, because it is just gossamer, but, fabulous entertainment and the culture, our culture and in English culture are being very puritanical, really misunderstands uh, words like uh, lightness, in, in other words, or, or frivolity. They, they, they think frivolity isn't serious. Frivolity is very serious if you make it a way of being. Um, it's a way of playing with the world and, um, dis and turning everything as he, he, he writes this in his songs. If you read the lyrics to his songs, which you should, they're very good. It's like light verse. Um, he, you know, uh, he, it's all about playing and turning everything into a game so that nothing can hurt you. You're always, it's all, it, my life is a game of masquerade. That's right, that's what, that's what Coward's life was. It was, a, it was a masquerade from beginning to end. And of course, you pay a great psychic price for that. But, he never wrote about that, you know. He watched his um, his persona like a hawk, as he said. Um, I, qu keeping in mind that quite literally stage management will start throwing things at me in five minutes. Can I just say, because I think this didn't come up, that, you know, I live in England, and we're very close to now the refugee problems and ISIS, much more close as I, closer than I think you feel over here. But when I, one of the things that startles me coming back to America is I, I think that Americans don't realize how successful terrorism has been in America. I, I think we are a terrorized society. And the, the proof of that, I mean, is the, the culture and, the, and the, the discussion is currently about how many people are being killed. But the purpose of terrorism is just not to kill people, but to kill thought. And what, what happens in that instance is that it divides people, it forces them into simplistic solutions. Let's build a wall. Let's send, let's send everybody back uh, to Mexico. You know, what all those, you know, when, when you look at the, at, the, at the gridlock, when you look at, you look at the, a, a, a war which we most likely shouldn't have fought, those were decisions made in haste, without thought. The, the culture seems at the moment, and it's a, it's a signal to me, in my, how I think, 
of it of a, of a certain passion for ignorance, a desire a desire not to think. And the whole job of theater, and the whole job of criticism, as opposed to reviewing, is to provoke thought, is to move people out of their received opinions, and to think against society, to look at other options. And that actually, oddly enough, is an antidote to terrorism, because it creates courage. It creates ideas. <laughs> I think, I think that's a good place to end. Thank you all. The next prologue is coming up in October. It's going to be me talking about Ibsen, and we'll send you all the information on that coming up soon. Thank you so much, and thank you, John Locke.